Hi, my name is Raha Daskip and I'm junior faculty at Johns Hopkins Hospital in the neurology department. It's a clinical department with a lot of resources and a lot of research. And I work with a lot of people who have a whole lot of data. So I live at that really uncomfortable interface between scientists and engineers where communication is the key to progress. So I'm going to share some of my insight with you and introduce an implemented example of how these methods can shed a lot of light on clinical data and hopefully lead to better understanding of pathological mechanisms in patient treatment. So before we dive into any data, I want to explain why communication is something that we need to think about and focus on. And communication is always important, but even more so when you're collaborating with people with different backgrounds. And while I Again, I won't be discussing a very large or complicated data set, but I want to stress that we live in the era of big data. And we have amazing capabilities to collect large data sets, which means that it's becoming more and more unlikely that the data that you analyze is from an experiment that you yourself conducted entirely. So teamwork is everything. And more and more, we're seeing data combinations of all sorts of different types of data, proteomics, genomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, do a lot of lipidomics. These are all large data sets created using different methods, which means that they have different limitations and things that you need to take into consideration when you're analyzing them. And since you're not doing it all, you need to be able to work closely with the people who are actually doing it. Communication is key. And in order to achieve that successfully, we need to be cognizant of the different backgrounds and approaches to science. So let's start with similarities and what we all have in common. I want to compare the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take with the engineering oath that professional engineers take. We are all mostly familiar with the Hippocratic Oath. It has that famous line of do no harm, which actually isn't in any of the official versions. But there's a lot more to it than that. It's an oath to take care of the sick. And while the engineering oath doesn't involve medicine per se, it does have an obligation to serve humanity and the public good. So what these both have in common is that the ultimate goal is always, always, always to improve human life. This should be the end goal of everything we do. And if we're not headed in that direction, then there is no significance. There's no point, And all we're doing is wasting time and resources. So now the differences. Uh, to highlight this, I want to draw a comparison between the scientific method that most clinicians and wet lab experimentalists come from and the engineering method that I come from. So I'm sure you remember the scientific method from like third grade. It starts with an observation that leads you to making a hypothesis and then you test it with an experiment and you reformulate. The emphasis is on the hypothesis that you test. In contrast, the engineering method is more focused towards product design. Um, but especially as we use more involved technologies and ways to measure, it's going to be incorporated into our science. It all starts with the problem definition or the question that you're trying to answer and the assumptions that you're making. So every engineering, every physics, every math problem starts with a basic statement of assumptions and boundary conditions. And your answer is only correct as far as your assumptions are. So you need to question them all the time. Um, and your assumptions aid in the design and analysis of the experiment. So the the traditional data science flowchart is almost an adaptation of this, starting with exploring your data because that's what your assumptions will be based on. So basically, to summarize, the scientific method is focused on your hypotheses, while the engineering method is focused on your assumptions. So that, now that we've sort of covered that discrepancy between the two mindsets, hopefully this can explain why machine learning in healthcare can be controversial. So traditionally, we're used to designing an algorithm running data through it like a function and calculating an output. But machine learning is, in a sense, the exact opposite. The data, along with the known output, are used to create a model. And uh, this is the reverse of the scientific method. It's not hypothesis-based, but I do think it is hypothesis-generating. This is a slide that I use to try to explain the categories of machine learning models because there is no one-size-fits-all model. Um, and it's really important when deciding what model to use to discuss what your ultimate readout is, taking into account the balance between power and interpretability. So often the most powerful predictive models uh, are the ones that are the least interpretable. And I think that in the context of medical data, if it's not interpretable, it's not really usable. If you don't know how or why you have a certain solution, it's hard to trust it and it might actually be dangerous to use. So remember that the end goal is always to improve human health. So we need to focus on what our important outputs are. Uh, dimension reduction can be used for uncovering latent factors and potentially identifying links between variables that were previously unknown. 
Prediction can be interesting, but perhaps hard to trust from an uninterpretable model. And so oftentimes what we're left with is variable importance metrics that are, again, hypothesis generating. So what are the, some of the things that we can try to glean from clinical data? Well, oftentimes we can try to create predictive models, which can include diagnosis or trajectory of disease. And when I say trajectory, I mean predicting who gets better, or who gets worse. And these can be useful, for example, in clinical trials, especially short ones, given time constraints. But again, given the difficulty with interpretability of nonlinear models, we might be a ways away from using them all the time. And we can use variable importance to create new hypotheses for biomarker identification, uh, again, either for diagnosis or trajectory prediction. And in order to reach our end goal of better treatment, we're also interested in mechanism, because if we can understand how and why you're getting sick, we stand a better chance of coming up with a treatment for it. So in order to give an implemented example, I'm going to use one of my own research interests, which has to do with HIV in the brain. Now, until I joined this apartment, I did not know that HIV affected the brain, uh, but it does. And in fact, in the early days of HIV, the end stage of disease would result in something called HIV-associated dementia. Now, our focus, again, is improving human health. And in order to understand how to treat this, it would be helpful to understand why it's happening. And from a biological perspective, this is very difficult to understand because while the virus can get into the brain, it can't infect neurons. So neurons are uninfected by the HIV virus, but they are damaged somehow. And in order to be able to prevent that or treat it, we need to understand how. So this whole process is further complicated by the fact that HIV itself is very complicated and the landscape of the disease has changed over the years. This is mostly because of the introduction of widely available antiretroviral treatments which is wonderful because it means that most people can go about their day with an undetectable viral load and they are living mostly normal lives with normal lifespans. It also means that as they age, it becomes more complicated to disentangle what damage is happening as a result of the infection or aging or side effects from the antiretroviral agents themselves. So it's all very complicated and it's going to take a lot of data with clearly identified assumptions to be able to figure out what's happening and treat it better. There's been a lot of uh, large longitudinal data sets that have been collected over time uh, where people living with HIV have undergone neuropsychological testing repeatedly. Um, and by this, I mean a battery of different tests that measure different aspects of cognition. The raw test scores are transformed using a normative population to something called a T-score, which has a Gaussian distribution with a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. And these T-scores for individual tests are then grouped according to cognitive domains. So verbal fluency, executive function, motor function. Um, now, traditionally, cognitive dysfunction or impairment in HIV has been categorized according to something called the Frascati criteria, where you're considered impaired if you have at least one standard deviation below the mean in at least two cognitive domains. It doesn't matter which domain they are. It can be motor function and executive function or verbal fluency and recall. According to this definition, it doesn't matter what those domains are as long as you match the standard deviation criteria. I don't think this makes a whole lot of sense. And I'm going to spend the rest of this talk using data to argue why I think this is wrong and why it's holding us back from making more progress and uncovering mechanisms and finding better treatments. In fact, we can already see based on the common domains showing impairment that there's been a shifting in the way that people living with HIV are impaired. It's different now that most people have access to antiretroviral therapies. Um, before I get into the data, the logic is this. We know that different brain regions and neuronal circuits are associated with different cognitive domains. So it stands to reason that impairment or declining function in certain cognitive domains would be associated with different mechanisms than others. Now, some studies have shown success using global metrics instead of domain-specific metrics in identifying biomarkers of change. And by that, I mean that they combine the scores in all domains instead of looking at individual ones. In this example from our group, classification trees were used to come up with hypothesized mechanisms of impaired cellular metabolism in the context of HIV. And this has actually led to a clinical trial that's currently in progress. But by and large, biomarker searches have been unsuccessful. And so we need to take a step back and ask why. 
Could it be that our assumptions are wrong? Could it be that our problem definition is wrong? So the example that I'm going to show you, um, we use to try to explore the same data and redefine the questions that we're asking. It's actually been published already in full disclosure. It was done in R, not Python. Uh, but for the purposes of this presentation, I've redone it in Python, which was a nice confirmation that we got the same results. So this is, again, a really simple analysis, but as we move forward, it gets more complicated and Python will be necessary, um, which is why this particular community is so important to me. So this study was uh, it used a subset of a, of a cohort called Charter, where people living with HIV came in for multiple visits approximately six mo months apart. And at each visit, they gave biological samples and underwent that battery of neuropsychological testing that I showed you. Um, so the idea here was that if we could find a way to predict who's getting better and who's getting worse, we could come up with a hypothesized mechanism and hopefully better treatments. Um, but when we were combining all cognitive domains and using a global metric, it, we didn't have much success. So we needed to take a step back and re-question our assumptions. And the first step in data science is always to explore the data. Um, and data visualization can come in really helpful here. So especially when you have more variables than we have here. Um, so first we calculated a different score, which was basic subtraction of the two visits of each participant. So we're only using two visits at this time, and they are evenly spaced apart. So basically we have a linear model and subtraction is sufficient. And we see that the overall distribution of change in each domain is normally distributed around zero, and that there are changes in both positive and negative directions. The direction of change isn't, it's not skewed in any specific direction. Um, so this is a simple plot made with Python, and I think it, it gets the point across easily. You could make a table with a lot of different measurements, including uh, skewness and kurtosis, and maybe that would be fine if you're only looking at seven variables. But in general, the more data you put into a table, the more intimidating it becomes, and the less people are likely to pay attention without losing the bigger message. So the more information you can communicate in a nice, simple figure, the better. And Python is pretty good at doing that. So then we wanted to see visually if there were any patterns in change scores. And when we looked at the parallel coordinates or spaghetti plot, it doesn't look like there's any obvious patterns. Nothing really stands out. I, I don't see any obvious groupings. It all looks like a big mess, but it was worth a look. And this would be the scientific methods version of an observation that would lead to further inquiries if we were to see a pattern here. So next we, uh, we have an example of the correlation of change scores. We could, again, do this in a table, but uh, a figure could get this information across much more clearly. Uh, this figure is actually made with a custom function. I wasn't able to find a package that would reproduce what I wanted. So in R, it's called the core plot package. It's really useful. Um, I couldn't find a Python corollary, but if you know of a version in Python, please let me know. I would really appreciate it. Anyways, what we take from this figure is that how people change in individual domains isn't very highly correlated with how they change in others, with the exception of recall and learning domains. I would say this argues that it is inappropriate to clump change altogether. So we're showing that someone who gets better in the verbal domain, for example, isn't necessarily getting better in executive function and vice versa. But is there something that we're missing here? So a very common first step is to try to reduce dimensions or uncover latent factors using principal component analysis. I'm sure this audience is familiar, but I found PCA to be one of the easiest dimension reduction methods to explain to non-programmers because it's just a linear transformation and I can use lollipop plots to show how different variables contribute to each new component. In this case, again, it's a very small data set with only seven original variables, and we can reduce it to five components that account for over 85% of the total variance in the original data. What I'd like to draw your attention to is the loading plot for the first three components. I think this is a really nice visual because even before we cluster anything, it makes the case that different domains are contributing different, uh, they're contributing differently to each principal component. Now for clustering, we stuck with k-means and we used the elbow method to decide on the, the final number of clusters. I know this might not be the best method. There are other ones and you can defend them all. Um, 
But ultimately, you do need to defend and explain what method you use. And in general, especially with clinical data, the simpler the explanation, the better. So here, the silhouette plot also helps to show that we have four well-separated groups. And the next step is to see what those groups are. And that's how we come up with our final trajectory phenotypes for this particular data set. We have four clusters of people who showed similar patterns of change. And one of these, the second cluster, is a cluster that got worse specifically in the executive function domain. So it doesn't really show changes in other domains. And the data is showing us that this is an important group of people. But if we were to use the original criteria of two domains, this group would have been ignored entirely because they're only showing change in one domain. And uh, there's also another group that shows changes only in verbal fluency. And I, I would argue that by grouping all of these cognitive domains together using a global metric, we'd be washing out these specific changes. So what's next? Uh, now that we've taken a step back and redefined what we're measuring, we can go back to try uh, trying to find out in you know, our really vast array of data what predicts group membership using machine learning models that, and, um, that examine nonlinear relationships and help us come up with new hypothesized mechanisms that we can test. Also, what I've shown you in this very simple example is just a linear model. Again, only two time points. Um, so we could subtract and narrow it down to one time point. I uh, don't want to assume that all change is linear. So my current grants are actually funding me to create nonlinear models and identify their predictors. So to do this, I've proposed to use dynamic time warping and signal analysis methods. And for that, I definitely need Python. So as I started out trying to explain, teamwork is everything and no one can do it all on their own. I've had a lot of help considering that all I work with is the numbers. I didn't recruit participants. I didn't collect samples. I didn't do any of the testing. In fact, all of that was done before I joined this group. Um, there's a lot of very dedicated scientists and clinicians who are working together for the ultimate goal of improving human health, and I thank them. And most of all, we owe it to the participants who donate their time and comfort so that we have data to analyze to try to help other people with. Lastly, I thank you for watching. I know this isn't the SciPy meeting we were all expecting, but the team has done a really great job of putting it together virtually. And I'm not sure how questions are going to work out, but there are multiple ways of contacting me if you have questions or suggestions. Uh, also, if you or someone you know is looking for a computational postdoc position, definitely get in touch because we will be hiring.